Hey all, here OS Reviews. In this video, we're taking a revisited look back at the OnePlus 10T here in 2024. This was an Android smartphone that came out in the second half of 2022, making it approaching two years old later this year. So this was at a point in time when OnePlus did not have the best reputation because they started to merge their software with color OS inspired theme going on as compared to the more fresh and vanilla feel of Oxygen OS back in the day. And also in terms of value, the pricing on OnePlus phones has started to increase year over year while seemingly getting rid of some fan favorite functions. For instance, this 10T no longer has a classic slider on the side for easily putting the phone into mute. And especially compared to the days of, say, the OnePlus 7 Pro that came out a generation or two prior, it was really OnePlus at their height, in a sense, because the software was super clean while having a very futuristic design for the time, having a pop-up selfie camera making the display completely uninterrupted, being one of the first phones on the market with a fast refresh rate screen, and still retaining a fairly attractive price point as well. So in contrast, the OnePlus 9 and OnePlus 10 were not critically super well received, but I think it's because of that point that these phones are now very affordable. If you're looking on the used marketplace, it can be found often for under 300 bucks, putting it into budget territory, which for a phone that isn't even two years old, with pretty powerful specs, including the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1, that is manufactured on TSMC facilities, offering better power consumption and efficiency as compared to the regular 8 Gen 1 that was using Samsung's facilities. That being said, in the past year or so, I would say the reputation that OnePlus had is starting to turn around again because they are putting out more affordable devices, including the recent OnePlus 12R, and has a very clean flagship grade appearance, but despite that can be found new for under 500 bucks so it becomes, yet again, one of the more flagship killer-esque devices, which is what made OnePlus a fan favorite back in the day. So it's great to see them starting to find their roots yet again. This OnePlus 10T also packs pretty much identical specs to the OnePlus 11R, and the R series, again, is kind of their more light version of their regular flagship, except the 11R actually wasn't sold in the US. It was more of an exclusive in Asia and India markets. However, it packs, again, similar chipset, including the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1, which, again, is around $200 even cheaper than the current 12R, if we had to make that comparison. I would say that the OnePlus 10 generation started to introduce the design language that we're more familiar with to this day. Of course, they now have a round circle for the camera ring, but this kind of quadruple setup going on in the corner of the phone is still a trend that we're seeing. It has a glass finish on the front as well as the back, but what's interesting is the texture they've added to the glass, which makes it feel almost like a piece of fabric. So it has a bit of a groove and texture to it as you're holding it, making it resist fingerprints a little bit more. And the glass is actually one piece. It's just a different finish that extends on this camera section, which has almost this metal-like appearance. But again, this is actually still glass. So it's quite interesting how there's almost these optical illusions going on with glass manufacturing these days, whether it's trying to simulate fabric, trying to simulate metal, but in the end it still has all the properties of glass. Now one thing that is missing on the OnePlus 10T though compared to the regular OnePlus 10 that came out slightly earlier in the year would be not having any Hasselblad branding on the cameras. One can say that that's marketing to some extent, but they collaborated with this camera manufacturer to do some color tuning on their images, making it look perhaps a little bit more pleasing, even though the sensors are technically produced by Sony. So speaking of, we have a 50 megapixel primary sensor, which is actually the exact same one, still being used on the OnePlus 12R as well as the 11R as well. One over 1.56 inch sensor, which is decent size, has optical image stabilization. That being said, the secondary camera is an 8 megapixel ultra wide angle, which is a little bit low in terms of megapixel count, definitely softer compared to the regular OnePlus 10. And also there is a third macro sensor, which is only 2 megapixels for ultra close up shots that honestly isn't as practical as something like a ultra wide angle or a telephoto zoom lens. The LED flash ring on this phone is also extremely bright. It surprisingly casts a very good glow when you're using it as a flashlight as well. Otherwise, a 16 megapixel selfie camera could be found on the front. Now, the frame of the OnePlus 10T was crafted out of polycarbonate plastic, and although I 
am okay with plastic builds on phones. In fact, it can be a little bit more impact resistant. It doesn't feel quite as premium as aluminum metal, which is actually the material found on their newest OnePlus 12R. On the very bottom here, we have the SIM card slot. There is the USB Type-C port, which on the 10T here supports up to 125 watt and the entire 4,800 milliamp hour capacity battery can be topped up in around 20 to 30 minutes, which is insanely quick. Definitely one advantage compared to something like Google's Pixel phones, which are still stuck on 20 watt charging, quite slow by modern standards. There's stereo speakers, one on the very top side, and otherwise on the right hand spine is just a power key located on the Left hand side is going to be just the volume rocker and that is more or less it. There is no 3.5mm headphone jack on this particular phone, but that's kind of par for the course these days. And turning the phone around, we're greeted to a 6.7 inch Full HD Plus resolution AMOLED display with a fast 120Hz refresh rate. This is also a flat panel, which is a trend that is starting to become popular yet again here in 2024, as manufacturers have gone to a point where the bezel sizes are honestly small enough that it no longer really needs to be curved off to hit an impressive screen-to-body ratio. At the same time, it's a little bit more practical because there are no accidental touches as you're gripping onto the sides. It also has 10-bit color that's compared to 8-bit color found on the majority of other kind of mid-tier Android smartphones you can find at this price point. And it actually comes into handy because you are able to shoot in 10-bit color mode with the camera that we'll see in a moment. And supposedly it just preserves a wider gamut of colors, providing a little bit more saturation, contrast, and the phone is otherwise equipped with up to 16 gigabytes of RAM. 8 gigabytes is the minimum, along with either 128 or 256 gigabytes of built-in storage. When combined with the already efficient 4 nanometer Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1, again from TSMC, it equates to a very good battery endurance. In fact, this phone can get well over 8 if not even 9 hours of screen on time before you have to recharge it again, and topping it up is also extremely fast. You really no longer have to worry about battery at all since you just have to bring along a power bank, top it up for just a few minutes, and you're ready to go once again. That is one of the, I think, best attributes of this device, even though it does lack support for Qi wireless charging. Of course, the 8 Plus Gen 1 is a 5G equipped chip, so you are able to get fast cellular data in addition to dual band Wi-Fi 6, as well as standards like GPS, Bluetooth, NFC. Software-wise, the phone is currently on Oxygen OS 13, aka Android 13, but Android 14 updates have already started to roll out, and the phone is slated to receive up to Android 15 later in 2025, with additional firmware and security updates available until 2026 at a minimum. Even though this version of Oxygen OS is already heavily inspired by Oppo's ColorOS when it comes to the icons, as well as some of the menus that you're able to interact with by pulling down this shelf of icons, for example, it's still quite fast and fluid because of the display and the processor inside, but compared to the actual Oxygen OS days from something like the OnePlus 7 Pro here, you can tell a pretty big difference. That being said, you do have plenty of options to pick between for personalizing the phone, for instance, under sound and vibration, you'll find some additional enhancements to the haptic vibration motor that's called O-Haptics. And I have to say that this is actually one of the biggest improvements that I could feel on this device compared to the OnePlus 7 Pro that we checked out from before. Whether something is getting popped like a balloon, if you're playing back a game for instance, or the small gears and clicks in the UI, it is definitely more of a flagship grade experience from the Z vibration motor one nice quality of life improvement on this device and under sound you can also find Adobe Atmos support which is more of a software enhancement just to give you a little bit more of stereo separation if you're consuming movies for instance along with also spatial audio that you can flick on on supported tracks uh, just to give you a little bit more immersiveness as well. Under display settings you can also find the ability to access a eye comfort mode and also colors that you can fine tweak into more natural, vivid, or under pro, find a cinematic mode for becoming P3 if you're trying to get the most accurate colors, if you're doing something like video editing or photo editing, or brilliant slash cool and warm that you can adjust between. You can also take a look at having a HDR conversion mode flicked on that will upscale regular videos into a more high dynamic range along with the aforementioned scaling down of the fast refresh rate if you want to consume even less power. But again, with the ultra-fast charging and the super energy-efficient, powerful A Plus Gen 1 chip inside, I personally didn't really find it necessary to do that. 
And then all the other special features here are basically things we've already seen with Color OS products in the past, including split screen multitasking that you can trigger by swiping up with three fingers and you can then pull up, again, two applications at once. There's even flexible windows that you can play around with, although since the phone's display is not quite as large as the tablet, maybe it doesn't make quite as much sense here, but if you wanted to, you have this mini app that kind of floats around the UI there for you to interact with, something I think that many Sony Xperia phones also allowed you to do back in the day. One feature that is missing on the OnePlus 10T, though, would be video output support via the Type-C. So on devices like the OnePlus 7 Pro, for example, you connect it to an external monitor or a pair of head-mounted displays by using that port. On here, unfortunately, it's only for charging and data transfer, and if you want to share your screen, you have to connect it wirelessly via screencasting, as well as a smart sidebar over here, similar to on Samsung Galaxy devices, where you're able to instantly take a screenshot, record your screen, as well as take a look at your commonly used applications. And last but not least, you can even find a easier to use simple mode if you're giving it to the elderly or a child that gives you just larger icons as well as restricts certain type of applications that you can access on the phone. So at the very least, there are plenty of settings almost akin to that of Samsung's One UI. And that Samsung analogy also extends on air gesture support. You can answer calls just by flicking your hand a little bit further away from the screen. The final thing I'll mention is that you are able to have virtual RAM expansion on this phone as well via software. As we've touched on before, it's not exactly the same thing as actual physical RAM, but it borrows some of the storage, aka ROM, to simulate RAM, helping you do just a little bit more multitasking. So you can expand it by up to 8 gigabytes on top of either the standard 8 or 16 based on what version of the phone you have, giving you plenty to work with when it comes to multitasking. Now aside from dragging down to access a shelf of some widgets and commonly used programs, you're also able to long hold here to change things like wallpapers, the way that icons are being displayed, if you want them to be rounded off, slightly larger versus smaller, and you can also customize the transition effects. Newer Oxygen OS functions, including the ability to generate your own wallpapers using AI, can also be done on here. This also provides you a better opportunity to see the exact bezel size of the phone, which is still very respectable. I think, honestly, anything above 90% screen-to-body ratio is still already very immersive. The chin on the bottom there is nearly symmetrical with the other sides, and just a very small again, hole punch for that front-facing camera. Quite beautiful looking, I have to say, and no issues here when it comes to visibility or viewing angles. A couple of built-in wallpapers can also be found that shows off the vibrancy of this panel, which we have seen perhaps on some other OnePlus devices in the past as well. But you get that idea here, that fluid AMOLED or OLED screen that you can further play around with. So taking a closer look at the camera next, the UI is pretty simple to operate. You're able to jump into a uh, kind of normal crop as well as a two times digital crop. Again, there is no true ultra wide angle lens here. It's all using that primary sensor. Google Lens support for searching up barcodes and objects and also the ability to add a filter can be found on here as well. On the top, we can turn on the AI automatic scene detection mode, which will slightly change the image properties depending on if you're pointing it at a landscape, food, text, for example. High res capture will save the image at the full 50 megapixels versus typically bending it down to 12 megapixels to consume less space. And if we tap on more, you're able to switch on or off the 10-bit color mode. So again, this will save the photos as a HEIF format, and you're only able to get the full benefit of 10-bit color photos when you're viewing it on a 10-bit color display. So that still tends to be a little bit more of a premium feature, but on supported devices like on this phone, you are able to just see a little bit more contrast. Now there's also 4K for video capture, including HDR video, night vision mode, which will increase the exposure time a little bit more to capture a bit more light. And under more, you can find a pro mode for a more granular adjustment of properties like ISO and white balance, as well as typicals, including slow-mo, panoramic, long exposure, dual view, which will capture both with the front and the rear cameras, and also the aforementioned macro lens as well. But because there's no OIS, you have to hold very still, and the resolution isn't going to be quite as detailed as the primary sensor if you start zooming and cropping in. It's more of a novelty lens, definitely not as practical as a ultra-wide angle in most cases, or a telephoto zoom. But it is what it is, one of the areas they cut down on cost that unfortunately is still a trend that we're seeing on many other phones on the market, especially in the more budget and mid-tier range. Here's an example of the primary camera though, which actually has a pretty decent looking bokeh natural fallout there from these sides because the sensor is decent, again 1 over 1.5 inch. Here's also an example of low light performance captured 
almost in the evening times, and you can tell that it's actually doing a fair job. You have to hold relatively still, of course not quite as magical as on pixels and iPhones when it comes to the extent of the computational processing work, but still is respectable. Here's an example of the regular 12 megapixel mode, so we can try cropping into a detail like, let's say, a branch over here. This is as much as we can zoom on in, versus the 50 megapixel image, we can definitely crop in even further, even though these photos in 50 megapixel mode will take up around three to four times larger file size. Now, in terms of the ultra wide angle lens, again, you do see a noticeable drop in the sharpness and resolution if you zoom on in, but from afar, the contrast and HDR are still quite vibrant looking, and there's decent lens correction on the edges. And here's also what a two times digital crop looks like, which is still all right. But again, as you zoom in further from this point, you start to introduce more noise. So all in all, I would say, even though the OnePlus 10T doesn't have the best camera in the entire smartphone space, which is getting increasingly competitive these days, I have to admit that it's still a very solid performer. As you can tell here, in most conditions, it captures vibrant looking images with a little bit of natural bokeh as well, especially with that primary sensor, that it should be more than adequate uh, for the vast majority of cases out there. You are also able to install something like Gcam, which is basically porting over a version of the Google Pixel camera software onto a phone like this if you want to borrow some of Google's magic and software processing that can even further improve the images from this point. But personally, I think the default camera app already does a good enough job in most instances, and I do think it is an improvement compared to the OnePlus 7 Pro, which had a little bit softer looking images by contrast. And now moving into a quick demo of what video playback and the speakers sound like on YouTube. Takeaway being that the stereo speakers are quite immersive, especially some of the audio enhancement profiles on top of this, and it sounds great for a smartphone, honestly. This is going to be very enjoyable with this beautiful display for consuming movies on YouTube, Netflix, and the like. But even the newer generation Snapdragon H Gen 3 is still 4 nanometers in terms of architecture size like this, and again, still manufactured on TSMC facilities, which is an improvement compared to the original 8 Gen 1 and the 888, which were again on Samsung facilities that had, unfortunately, some overheating tendencies if you push the phone a little bit harder, thermal throttling, and the phone just became a lot more toasty, similar to on Google's Tensor chips on the Pixel phones. Whereas this device pretty much runs cool 24-7, regardless of how hard you're pushing it, not to mention still reacting super fast as well. And it should come as no surprise, if you're doing some web browsing, it can handle that with ease. Pages load up almost instantly, and reception quality, especially with the plastic kind of band here, is extremely strong, getting almost full bars, in fact, for both Wi-Fi as well as 5G. So it loads up in really no time at all, even on more complex sites with plenty of different videos and ads, never really misses a beat. And aside from the Google Essential apps, you'll also find a couple of utility tools from OnePlus, aka Oppo and ColorOS these days, such as their kind of voice recorder, which is a nice extra since there is no built-in voice recorder on stock Android, I suppose. There's also kind of a notes app, which is designed by them not to mention their versions of a clock app as well that just introduces a slightly different design flair. And you also find something called the O Relax, which is just an app that plays back some nature sounds to help you unwind or fall asleep, playing it for X minutes of time. A pretty simple one, but a thoughtful extra, I suppose, compared to stock Android. And as far as gaming is concerned, Oxygen OS does have some additional menus that can be triggered for doing things like checking the FPS rate, as well as closing out of any background apps to prevent any notifications, for instance, while you are gaming. And the overall experience is, as aforementioned, still going to be flagship grade. There are no games from the store that you aren't able to download and play, whether it's heavier titles like PUBG, Asphalt, Minecraft, will all play back at the fastest frame rates, even on the highest graphic settings more performant than really any application at this point uh, will use, even now in 2024. So this is excellent combined with the great cooling, energy efficiency of the chip already, means that you are able to game for pretty long sessions without having to encounter any issues. It also goes without saying that the basics, including making phone calls, are also flawless on here, no real issues to speak of. Microphone quality has been extremely solid, very clean and crisp, with good noise reduction as well if you're in louder situations, as we talked about previously, strong antenna reception to boot. So that is more or less it as far as our revisited look back at the OnePlus 10T. 
To a certain extent, I can understand why OnePlus fans and critics weren't overly enthusiastic about this device when it came out, because at a time it seemed to lose some of the classic features uh, while having a slightly more generic looking design from afar at least. However, in retrospect, now that you can find this device at such a vastly discounted price, again, sometimes as low as $200 when shopping around, it is still an incredible value for the money, I have to say. And thus, if the OnePlus 12R might still be a little bit too much for your current budget, you're looking to save even more. Gotta say that the 10T, one of the more forgotten about OnePlus phones, plus some of the more subtle design choices with the textured back and the haptic vibrations and audio, I think still make it a great choice. You can learn more details if you're interested, but for now that's been our video. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews. That's been a look back at the OnePlus 10T.